Happy Halloween, Brainiacs! Do you like my costume? I'm dressed up as my favorite brain-based monster, the zombie. Welcome to this year's Halloween episode of Neurotransmissions. This week, we have a special guest, and things are about to get spooky. <laughs> To help me with this Halloween episode, I have asked Dr. Bradley Wojtek to join us today. Before we begin, can I offer you some Halloween candy? I will candy? take another one, yes. Okay. Thank you. You know, if Halloween candy's not really your style, maybe I can offer you some brains. Uh-uh. No? I'm not for the zombie. <laughs> Dr. Wojtek is an assistant professor of computational cognitive science and neuroscience at UC San Diego, which is quite a mouthful. Before we get into zombies, can you share with us what got you interested in cognitive science in the first place and why you decided to go down this career path? Uh, yeah, so initially I was actually a physics major as an undergraduate. When I was a teenager, I used to think about like the universe, like how did we get here, right? Like that was what it drew me to physics. So I worked in a lab making Bose-Einstein condensates, which are, uh, you slow atoms down to like a billionth of a degree above absolute zero and they do really weird things. And I thought that would be amazing. And it didn't really keep my interest. Um, but then watching, especially my grandfather, who was a really smart guy, suddenly mm -hmm. decline rapidly. I realized that, you know, you could be thinking about these big things, but the thing that allows you to do that thinking about these really big things can go so wrong. So I took a class in psychology with a friend of mine uh, on a whim, and then I switched my major to psychology, uh, and I just kind of cobbled together my own neuroscience major. I took programming classes and like artificial intelligence, and I fell in love. Now that boring research stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about zombies. The fun stuff, yeah. <laughs> so, um, what's your zombie cred? So it started, uh, to be honest, uh, a bunch of PhD students sitting around doing movie night and drinking beer. And what happens when you get a bunch of neuroscience PhD students together drinking beer and watching, <laughs> you, you know, sure, well, why are they moving like that? Oh, it's, you know, maybe it's uh, ataxia. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And you start arguing about it. And uh, I've been running a, a blog, neuroscience -y blog thing. So my, my friend, uh, Tim Versteinen, who was a grad student at Berkeley with me at the time, he and I had been uh, watching a lot of these movies and talking about this whole zombie as a brain mechanism. We do, around Halloween, a series of like joint blog posts where we break the zombieism down into its constituent parts. And so we started putting all these ideas together and it just snowballed. And we got an email from, uh, from a publisher, uh, Princeton University Press, saying, hey, I saw these blog posts you, you guys have done. Can I take you out to lunch? and talk about turning those posts into a book. So you came up with this great term, which we love, the Consciousness Deficit Hypoactivity Disorder as the medical diagnosis for, right. for zombieism. How does talking about zombies kind of reflect what we're actually studying in real human disorders? Most of what we know, a lot of the core basic things that we first learned about the brain, we learned from people who had something go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had some kind of stroke or traumatic brain injury. Phineas Gage is the <laughs> classic example that everyone learns that takes an intro to psych class, pretty mm -hmm. much. We really were trying to walk that line of impressing upon people that fact, while also not making light of it, mm -hmm. right? Part of the whole mentality in the book also was kind of poking fun at neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and mm -hmm. psychology and psychiatry, which is this strange, I would say, almost over-medicalization. So we just sort of tack on names to a list of symptoms, which is what the DSM, which is the diagnostic manual that psychiatrists use to define disorders, really is. It's like, do you have at least four of these seven symptoms? If, if so, then you are bipolar or schizophrenic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're doing here, is we have just, we're making up a list of symptoms. We're saying, this is what zombies are. Speaking of symptoms, do you have a, have a favorite symptom of zombies? It didn't used to be this, but because it always comes up, I've thought about it so much that it is now my favorite, which is the, the fast versus slow zombies. Really? Like what is it? Yeah, zombie aficionados fight about this. Uh, fast zombies are not real zombies, according to one whole faction, right? They're not real zombies. So the rage infected creatures in, say, 28 Days Later are not mm -hmm. zombies. Part of why I like the zombie genre is every movement, every movie has a different origin. Mm -hmm. of zombieism, And that's even become so much of a trope that every zombie movie has a different origin that it's become a thing to make fun of. <laughs> so in Shaun of the Dead, they actually joke about that throughout. If you listen carefully, like he walks into uh, the corner store and on the radio they talk about a deep space satellite that's re-entering Earth. Deep space probe, Omega 6, due to return to Earth 
Then there's something else later on in the newspaper. And another one about like nuclear weapons testing. And it's hitting on all the tropes of what has caused zombieism in different zombie movies over history. Yo! Yeah, I'm with customers. With that out of the way, I actually had an opportunity to interview George Romero, who directed the original Night of the Living Dead. We asked him, you know, why do zombies move so slow in your movies? Why, you know, why, why slow versus fast? And he just was like, looked at me like I was the biggest idiot in the world because he's like, well, because they're dead. In the book though, we actually talk about, we call it our time to resurrection hypothesis. So you look at something like the Night of the Living Dead, the original zombie movies, the slow zombies, they're dead for months, mm -hmm. maybe even years. Whereas in something like, you know, Shaun of the Dead, they're a little bit more coordinated, but they're not fast. Uh, and the time between the initial bite and zombieism is, you know, hours. Mm -hmm. Whereas then you look at something like 28 days later, you get bitten or a drop of blood even, you know, in your eye. You. Yeah. And in seconds, mm -hmm. you become a zombie. And so the argument is the longer between the initial infection and the turning, the slower you are. If it takes longer to act on you, then it, it destroys more brain tissue and nervous tissue. Yeah, it doesn't always hold true, but it actually, surprisingly, accidentally, most movie makers seem to actually fit that pattern. Like 28 Days Later, it's a zombie movie. Mm -hmm. They're fast and it's a totally different feel, but it is still a zombie movie. Do you have a favorite or ideal zombie? Like, would you go all the way back to the classic, the Romero zombies, or do you think kind of the more recent, like Shaun of the Dead type zombie? What's your, do you have a favorite? Okay, so I do have specific zombies who are my favorites. So <laughs> um, one is Tar Man, he, he's in a barrel that may have been full of tar or something like that. <laughs> he comes out of his barrel and he just says, brains. And that's actually the movie that started the brains thing. Like for 20 years of zombie movies before that, they had nothing to do, zombies didn't have anything to do with eating brains. The second would be in Land of the Dead, one of the more recent Romero films, there is a old man zombie with a tambourine. And so I keep trying to imagine the backstory of the zombie apocalypse is occurring. And there's this old guy who's just like, I need my tambourine right now. As a quick pop quiz, I'm gonna list off a couple movie monsters and then we can talk about possible connections to neuroscience, how they how that might exist. Okay. All so right. you ready? Yeah. All right, Frankenstein's monster. Okay, so he's he's really just a bunch of body parts reanimated, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and they, they suck together and they emphasize really the body parts. So I think Frankenstein's monster, it's probably dealing with just the existential crisis of uh, not knowing his own body, right? There's the whole embodied cognition mm -hmm. aspect of neuroscience, which is um, our ability to think and interact with the world isn't just because of our brain. Mm -hmm. We have this entire interconnected nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. And if my body and limbs have been replaced with different sized limbs from different people, then I'm gonna have a very disoriented sense of self. I'm not actually gonna have a unified sense of self. I don't, my body doesn't feel like my own, mm -hmm. and that would cause a lot of probably mental anguish and trauma. Witches, so telekinesis. Do you okay. think that that's a, that could ever be a thing? Okay, so we already know that we can do um, brain implants. We can put a set of electrodes in the parts of the brain, the motor cortex, right, That that send signals down to the muscles to make them move. Mm -hmm. And we can just decode those electrical signals and instead have a person who may be paralyzed think and move you know, robotic limbs or something like that. We can mm -hmm. do that. But instead of having them move a robotic limb, why don't you have them you know, ha control you know, uh, quadrocopters or, or something like yeah. that, right? Like you can easily have somebody think uh, and, and control devices externally, right? You wouldn't be just like, I can pick up the lamp with my mind. There'd have to still be some kind of actuator yeah. um, of a thing doing it, but you could certainly do that. Why do you think that humans are drawn to horror? What makes it interesting? And why do we find it pleasurable in a way? Like you look at two tiger cubs roughhousing, mm -hmm. or I have, young, I have a young boy, four years old, when he's <laughs> roughhousing with his friend. They're kind of practicing, right? They're seeing what the limits are of, like, what can I do without getting hurt? You're sort of learning how to use your body. You're training yourself, basically. The tiger cubs, at least, for the moments when they actually do have to do something real, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of draw the same analogy with horror of, you know, we don't have to experience horror on a common basis. Uh, but it is still important, I think, for us to know how we would respond and not freeze up in tense situations. And so it's like an approachable way 
of experiencing fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's probably some of the draw for people. Well, again, uh, I have been talking with Dr. Bradley Wojtek uh, about his work on zombies and his work on actual neuroscience. So thank you so much for joining us oh, thank today. Thank you for having me. It was really I nice to talk it. to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.